Peace. This is your brother Jamal Brown, aka Mr. Black365, founder and creator of black365.com, the home of culturally relevant black history products that are suitable for all ages. You are with me for an, another exciting uh, listen, another exciting show. On this show, we'll, we will be discussing statues and particularly black statues that should be erected. If you've been living under a rock, that's the only place where you have not heard that there are um, statues falling by the day. A number of Confederate statues have fallen, statues of other uh, racist individuals have been taken out. Uh, people are talking about renaming schools, renaming bridges, and what have you. And uh, we are going to add to that discussion today. Uh, recently in the news, Brother John Lewis made his transition, and there has been some talk about renaming the bridge, the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, where he and a host of others were beaten savagely on what we know as Bloody Sunday. Let's hear from you and the listening audience. Do you think that that bridge should be renamed in honor of John Lewis? I have what perhaps is a uh, opposing view. Uh, I would I would rather see uh, a place of, dare I say, more valiant, more honorable, more place of higher esteem, a place that doesn't bring in uh, conflicting um, thoughts, conflicting feelings. Again, the brother nearly lost his life on that bridge. Uh, so some say honoring him there. I think that perhaps the city in which he was born or the university which he attended should be a better place for a statue to be erected, a building to be uh, placed in his honor. Again, let us know what you think. Some people think, no, rename the Edmund Pettus Bridge after John Lewis. Some say, now nah, perhaps there's a better place where we can honor the brother. Do you think that statues should fall? Do you think that Places should be renamed. Again, let us hear from you. Some say, hey, these statues are a part of the fabric of America. Uh, some say, hey, it shows the duality of the good and evil. Uh, of course, you perhaps know my thoughts and position. My position is that, indeed, uh, these Confederate statues uh, should be replaced. Just think about it. Uh, the Confederacy was a place that literally wanted and did detach from the United States. And they lost. So honestly, honestly, no cap. These statues and the, and the Confederate flag truly is emblems, truly are rather, emblems of losers. I mean, that's just really what it, really what it was. Again, the Confederacy lost, lost the uh, Civil War. So why were these statues erected? I'll tell you why these statues were erected. These statues were erected during a time in which there were Black uh, politicians that were being elected, Black businesses, Black inventions were being made in at a high rate. And so therefore, people saw it fit right after enslavement to put up these statues, these Confederate statues, as a symbol of terror. That's right. These were put up not so much to celebrate the individuals that they were supposedly celebrating, but really to terrorize Black people and say, hey, you're not that far removed from enslavement, and uh, we can put you right back in that thing. So truly, that's what the purpose of the uh, Confederate statues were. And so definitely, I think that they should be removed. And so this topic, this idea got me to thinking, you know, every invention, every thing that we see in the third dimension came from the mind. So it's important that we imagine, that we dream, that we hope, that we aspire. Um, one thing that colonization and racism, white supremacy has done, one thing that colonization has done is it has enacted the effect of the colonization of the imagination of our people too often. Let me say that one more time. That's a bar. Write this down. There has been a colonization of the imagination of people many times. And so uh, I've chosen to, to best of my ability, throw off the chains of colonization, throw off the chains of enslavement from my brain and begin to dream, begin to wonder. Again, I, I oftentimes uh, let my mind fly free and discover things in the far reaches of my mind and try to bring them to this reality. And so what I've done is attempted to think of seven statues. That's right, not one, not two, not three, but seven statues that if somehow I became appointed, you know, the uh, National uh, Parks and Parks and Rec uh, individual to cr create statues, purveyor of statues, what statues would I create? 
And without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into this thing. Seven black statues that should be raised today. Here's my list. I wanna see your list. Let us know who deserves a statue and why. And that's what we're gonna discuss here. Seven black statues that should be raised today. Again, if you have not seen these scenes, these are scenes that are taking place all over the country and in fact, all over the globe of statues being defaced and statues being removed. We can do better, take it down. That's what that sign says. This is racist, real simple message. This one here, brother showing his triumphant pose on a deposed statue here. And uh, this photo here is perhaps my favorite. Uh, some folks not only toppled, not only defaced, but toppled a statue and threw it in a river. Uh, even funnier, not in this piece that we're showing today is the people who appreciated the statue, trying to get the statue out of it. But the statue was heavy, apparently, and folks were nearly uh, blowing their back out, nearly breaking their backs, and almost falling in the water trying to get the statue out of the water. So again, statues are falling, campuses are being renamed, buildings are having names taken off of them. But what are we to do? What's the next action step? Should they be replaced? Should they be replaced with black people? I think so. And here's my list. First on that list is none other than the Honorable Moses of our people, Queen Mother Harriet Tubman deserves a statue in these United States. And here's why. And when, let me back up. When I'm talking about statues, I'm not talking about just a little, you know, six foot statue. I know there are statues of Harriet Tubman. And I appreciate them. I've seen them. I've, uh, you know, said, said silent prayers at the one in Boston or what have you. And I appreciate the statues. But when I'm talking about statues, in my mind, the far reaches of my mind, the extravagance, I'm, talk I'm talking about statues 60, 70, 80, 100 feet tall. National monuments for these giants of our culture, of these giants of our history who have done great things. They deserve huge statues. And here is why. Harriet Tubman, do you know that this sister made 13 documented trips from enslavement to freedom. Depends on your source, some say 19. I say that perhaps there were even more trips that just were not documented. But there are 13 conservatively estimated trips, 19 perhaps, even more, trips that she made from enslavement to freedom. She was born in um, Maryland, and she went to Pennsylvania for freedom. On that first trip, she talked about how the light of a free sun was golden and shined different on her skin. She made comments about how the birds were free, the fish were free, and it was so great to breathe free air. However, before long, she felt that it was not only her right, but her responsibility to go back and free her husband and other family members. Now, I'm just going to tell y'all, we're here on black365.com, and I love our people. However, I'm just going to keep it real. Can I keep it real one time? I don't know that if I had the stamina, the ingenuity, the faith, the hope, the courage, the wit, the intelligence to make it from enslavement to freedom, if I were to go back and save anybody. I mean, is it just me? Is it just me? Talk to me, leave a comment below. Would you have gone back? You've made it 90 miles, 100 miles, bloodhounds on your heels, folks trying to catch you. Would you have gone back? This sister, this warrior, this soldier, Harriet Tubman, made 13 documented trips. These trips, as I mentioned, weren't just easy trips. It wasn't just a stroll that she was making. There was a bounty on her head, $40,000 bounty. $40,000 is a lot of money then, $40,000 is a lot of money now. There was a bounty on her head all up and down the East Coast. There was a bounty on her head in Canada. That's right, those trips that she made and uh, it was 1851, 1861, uh, if I'm not mistaken, when the law changed, uh, they had to go even further north. There was an act that was passed that said, even in free states, formerly enslaved people can be recaptured and taken 
back to enslavement. So she had to go even further north to Canada. There was a bounty on her head. This sister oftentimes not only walked, not only ran, not only hid in swamps, not only hid in fields, but many times she would take the train and take trolley services back and forth to enslavement. Again, just think of the boldness. Just, just think of the savviness. Let's give you a glimpse into how intelligent Harriet Tubman was. These bounties, these posters, these wanted posters of her said that she was illiterate. So what did she do? Oftentimes she would have a newspaper with her. And as she was traveling via train, people get to look at her like, hey, is that, is that that one, is that her? She would uh, put the newspaper up in front of her face and act as if she was reading the newspaper. Again, true genius, true brilliance. Magnificent mind, Harriet Tubman. When she was walking, perhaps sometimes in towns that were highly populated, again, bounty on her head, most wanted. She would carry chickens with her and dress lowly like she was an enslaved African. And she would take these chickens and wrap a string tightly around their legs. And when again, people would begin to look at her and see, try to figure out, is that her? Let me go ahead and collect my 40,000. She would pull the string that was tied to the legs of the chicken so that the chickens would get all flustered and blustery and begin to flap annoyedly in her face. And people were like, oh, that's just a dumb slave girl. And we keep it pushing. This is how this sister, time and time again, eluded enslavement, time and time again, being the most wanted black woman in the face, on the face of this country, eluded enslavement and made freedom a reality for so many people. How many people did she make freedom a reality for? Some estimates say she saved 70, 70, 70 individuals of African descent. But we know that that number is incorrect. For she was the first woman to lead a major military operation, the Combahee River Raid took place on June 2nd, 1863. I know people in South Carolina are gonna get on me because I'm sure I did not pronounce that word correctly, C-O-M-B-A-H-E-E, -E, River Raid, that's in uh, Beaufort County, South Carolina. On June 2nd, 1863, she led, for the first time any woman had led a major military operation, she freed estimated 700 enslaved Africans on that day. So the number is really closer to 1,000 individuals of African descent were made free. Perhaps your and my ancestor, I'm talking about your and my direct bloodline, perhaps, was made free by this sister right here. We know Kanye said some foolish stuff recently. She didn't enslave nobody. Brother, that brother needs his mind examined. This here is an honorable message showcasing honorable people. We're not even going to get into the Kanye right now. That's what we're not going to do. We're going to keep it real. We're going to keep it right. We're going to keep it factual and actual. Nearly 700 people in one day were freed from the efforts and the energy and the perseverance and the determination of Harriet Tubman. This is why she deserves a statue. The first woman to lead a major military operation. She was a union spy. She was a union scout. She was a union nurse. Do you know that she was buried with full military honors? So for some who believe that there needs to be some military, militaristic aspect in order for someone to receive a statue, I disagree with that. But if that is on your list, you can check that box too. Because again, she was a part of the Union Army in this country. The Honorable Queen, Auntie, Mother, Warrior, Harriet Tubman. And when I think of these statues, I think on each side of the pillars, each side of the stands that hold up these statues, there should be words that describe these honorable folks. And here are the four words that I feel should be on each side of the platforms that hold up the statue for Queen Harriet. Valor, meaning in the face of all adversity, you shine. In the face of all adversity, you stand. In the face of adversity, you act and do what's right. That's real similar, synonymous perhaps to honor, honorable sister. Wisdom, again, coming up with these ingenious ways to remain undetected. For those reasons, we honor her 
for those reasons, she deserves a statue. And of course, her commitment, her commitment to the fight, her commitment to struggle, her commitment to doing what was right in the face of the most treacherous adverse conditions. Harriet Tubman deserves a statue. Let me give you a quotation from Queen Harriet here in our uh, Black 365 uh, cards. We have some cards that have 52 cards and 52 quotations from some of the greatest minds in our history. Harriet Tubman is showcased. Here is a quotation from her that I'm about to read right now is that, that is attributed to her. It says, every great dream begins with a dreamer. That's why we're doing this presentation right now. Every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. Harriet Tubman, she deserves a statue. Get one up today. Next up, who deserves a statue? None other than the unmatched, unequaled El Haj Malik Sabaz, formerly Detroit Red, formerly Malcolm Little, Malcolm X, Brother Omawali. All those names were attributed to Malcolm X throughout his life. He said of all his names, Brother Omawali was the name that he most appreciated. Omawali more or less means the sun has returned. That was the name that he was given while he was visiting Africa. Let's delve into why Malcolm X deserves a statue. He accomplished many, many, many goals despite being from a broken home. Now, I have broken home in quotations because when we think of broken home, we oftentimes think of divorce, we think of marital strife, we think of parents not getting along, and so the home is broken. That was not the case for Malcolm X. He was born of Earl Little and Louise Little. These were two tremendously talented, tremendously hardworking individuals. His father was a Garveyite. That means he was a person who went around the country putting forth the name, putting forth the honor, putting forth the message of Marcus Garvey, the Pan-Africanist who wanted to unify Black people all around the world. Uh, his mother was the regional secretary for Marcus Garvey's movement, the Universal Negro Improvement Association movement. Two fantastic people, two folks that were race people, meaning they put their race first in all that they did. That is why, that is how Malcolm X became who he was. However, because of his father's nationalism, because of his father's work and effort, his father was murdered. One night, the Black Legion, an offshoot of the Ku Klux Klan, got Earl Little, battered him, bruised him, tied him to railroad tracks for his body to be severed in two by a railroad. The brother was so strong strong-minded, had physical strength, and just perhaps even that honorary, they say that the brother lived for several hours before he ultimately succumbed to bleeding out. Earl Little, Malcolm X's father. Despite that, Brother Malcolm X continued to do well in school, continued to be an honorable young man. His mother eventually, because the funds weren't coming in, do you know that there were some insurance companies that said that it was a suicide? How do you beat yourself up? How do you tie yourself to a railroad tracks? How do you allow yourself to get ran over by a train after you've been beat up and tied? I don't know. But some insurance companies said that it was a suicide, so they would not pay. And so with the ingenuity of his mother, she rented out part of her farm, did some cooperative farming. Again, these were some advanced thinking Black folks in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. Um, so again, uh, the mother eventually succumbed to the financial pressures, to the pressure of raising several children and was committed to the Kalamazoo uh, Mental Health Institution there in Michigan. So then Malcolm had to go from house to house. He was put into the system and bounced around in several houses. Still, the brother's strong mind was, was strong. We all know the scene from the movie where one time in school, he was asked what he wanted to do, what he wanted to become, what were his career aspirations. He said that he wanted to become a lawyer because he was class president. He was top of the class and he wanted to use his mind, wanted to use his wit, wanted to use his articulation, wanted to use his intellect in order to make a living for himself. And in the language of the South, his teacher put him down gently, gave him a pat on the back and said, Malcolm, 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 
you know, your kind, probably said the N word, you know, your kind, ends. You can't do anything like that. No judge in America would give you a fair shake, something that they told the Paul Robeson as well. No judge, no jury in America would give your, you or your clients a fair shake. You can't do anything like that. Perhaps you should do something more industrious. Perhaps you should do something with your hands. This was the message of a teacher to a young impressionable Malcolm X who had already gone through all sorts of trauma, all sorts of mental health uh, traumatizing events had been uh, set before him. And that somewhat broke him. Yeah, you know, the brokenness of his father being murdered, and the brokenness of his mother committed to an institution, and now the people that he entrusted for his education and encouragement, being a, a teacher, telling him this, the brother was ultimately broken. And then he delved into a life of crime. He was a pimp, he was a drug user, he was a thief, all these sorts of things. He went by the name of Detroit Red. Um, and read, and again, just did some dishonorable things. Eventually went to jail for about six and a half years for robbery and things of that nature. There, while in jail, he read the entire dictionary. Read voraciously. When it was time for him and other inmates to go outside on the yard and get exercised, the brother would remain in his cell reading. It said that perhaps his eyesight went bad and he had to wear glasses because of how much he read in dimly lit environments. Brother was reading when they said lights out. Fantastic brother. He, once he finished with his nearly six and a half years of incarceration, he came out and grew one of the largest black organizations that this country has ever seen and gave it the battery, gave it the charge that it needed in order to stand and be what it is today. I'm talking about the Nation of Islam. He became a minister of the Nation of Islam. It was a floundering organization, not growing very fast, not many, not many members, but Malcolm X gave it the charge, put the battery in it, grew it, uh, made mosques as he flew. It's thought that he was the, the most uh, traveled black man on the planet at the time in the uh, 1960s. But he flew constantly from coast to coast, growing the organization. He created a newspaper that still exists to the day. He created the foundation for the newspaper that still exists to the day. Don't get on my head, NOI brothers. We're like, nah, 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 it's a different paper. Well, the paper that is created and that they sell in the corners now, the foundation for that paper was created by the minister Malcolm X. So, a tremendous organizer in honor of his parents. Do you know that when Malcolm traveled around the world, he was recognized on the world stage as a head of state? I'm talking about countries that roll out the red carpet for him as if he was an official ambassador of the United States all over Africa, all over the so-called Middle East. They gave him royal treatment. The brothers went around the country debating some of the top minds, some of the top scholars. There were several times in which, which he debated students at universities, professors at universities, not only in America, but in Britain as well. He was once denied entrance into France because they were like, this brother's too intelligent. He's too electrifying. The message and the passion and the words that he says electrifies people. And so, France denied his passport and would not allow, they said they would not allow him to get off the plane in France. And he wrote a scathing rebuke to France, said, I thought you were sovereign. I thought no one told one country what to do and who to let in and who to like and who to befriend. He talked about how are you gonna let America tell you what to do, France? But again, a fantastic brother, honorable brother, recognized on the world stage, Created institutions that last. For those reasons and more, Malcolm X deserves a statue, my humble opinion. I wouldn't be who I am if it wasn't for the words and the teaching and the example of manhood for Malcolm X. Of course, my father, of course, my mother, but aside from those two, Malcolm X. They used to call me young Malcolm in high school and in college. Lo and behold, years later, I would have a son born on the same day as Malcolm X, May 19th. Malcolm X, truly a hero. Some words that I would associate, some words that would be on the podium or platform that holds up a 100-foot statue of Malcolm X, fortitude. Again, just being strong in the face of adversity, not being swayed easily. Self-determination, the brother defined for himself, by himself, the course and direction 
that he would go in his life. Well, let me tell you this, after he left incarceration that final time, never one time was he associated with breaking law. Never one time was he associated with violence. Never one time was he ever caught, convicted, accused of beating anyone up, being violent towards anyone. Self-determination. Brother was brilliant, as I said. Brother was intelligent. Brother was articulate. And the brother, again, I've said it a couple times now, I'm gonna say it one more time, created institutions that last to this day. He was a shining example of manhood, a shining example of marriage. Not one accusation ever of him uh, stepping out on his uh, beautiful woman, beautiful wife, Dr. Betty Shabazz, had beautiful children, and amazing, amazing brother. We honor, we say Ashe to Malcolm X. Next up, we have the unconquerable, Madam C.J. Walker. You may have seen a film on Netflix, Self Made. The film got some things right. I got a bunch of things wrong. I did a review on that. Go ahead and check that video out as well. Madam C.J. Walker, one of the first self-made millionaires in this country. There were other women millionaires before Adam C.J. Walker. However, they were not self-made millionaires, the ones I'm thinking of. For example, let me just tell you a quick story. This is, this is an aside. You perhaps have heard of the Vanderbilt family. The Vanderbilt family, uh, there's a, in Tennessee, there's a university named the Vanderbilt family. There were women who were millionaires in the Vanderbilt family. However, let's just take a look. Let's peel back the layers. Let's peel back the curtain on how the Vanderbilt family got their wealth, how they got their millions. And the women in the Vanderbilt family became millionaires. They were in the fur industry, but they weren't fur trappers in the sense of they would go do the work of hunting the animals, stalking the animals, setting the trap for the animals, catching the animals, and then getting the fur and selling it. No, that's not what they did. What these folks did they would wait till someone else did the work. Someone else baited the trap. Someone else set the trap. Someone else discovered the patterns in which the animals were traveling, what have you. The Vanderbilt family would wait in the bushes, wait till the traps caught an animal that belonged to someone else, hop out of the bushes, steal the animals, run back, and then process the fur and sell the fur. That is how the Vanderbilt family earned their wages and earned their legacy. I'm talking about an honorable woman here. Every person in this video, in this presentation is honorable. Again, she was a self-made millionaire. She developed hair serums and hair salves in order to help sisters who were afflicted, as she said, were having to work from sun up to sun up down, from can't see in the morning to can't see at night. Oftentimes, as domestics with their hair wrapped in scarves, many sisters be uh, began to have uh, psoriasis and uh, bacteria infections on their head, losing hair, permanently damaging her scalp. She said she would commune with the ancestors. She, just like Harriet Tubman, she would fall asleep and wake up with direction. And that's how she developed these products. She was a non-selfish sister. She taught entrepreneurship. Do you know that there were thousands of Walker agents who sold Madam C.J. Walker's products from door to door? That's right, thousands of Walker agents who went door to door. She taught them all about look, presentation. She was a master marketing, a master businesswoman who developed all sorts of strategies, all sorts of business principles that are still used to this day. Fantastic sister fantastic entrepreneur who wasn't interested in just being rich for rich sake. She was interested in developing economic sovereignty, economic independence for black women. Truly a phenomenal system. She was a race woman. What does that mean? She put her race first in all that she did. Do you know that the mansion that she had built was built by the licensed black architect in the state of New York? That's right, she could have chose anybody. She could have chose anyone. She could have tried to keep up with the Joneses. I want a house that looks like the house that's next door. She could have flipped through some magazine pages and said, give me a house like that. But no, the house that she had, had wall, had floor, ceiling drapes, had art on the ceiling, had multiple, multiple garages for her multiple, multiple cars. Madam C.J. Walker. She was a race woman, as I just said. Whenever Marcus Garvey would have business meetings with men from all men and women and business people from all over the world 
she would allow Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association to use her home so that the first impression, the lasting impression that these business people who are looking to invest in the Universal Negro Improvement Association would have would be that of grandeur, that of luxury, that of these black folks really got it going on. Madam C.J. Walker, self-made millionaire, business mastermind, race woman, fantastic sister. Some words that would be on the four corners, the four pillars, the four sides of the pillars that hold up her 100 foot statue would be cooperative economics, spiritual woman, brilliant and intelligent as well. I know I didn't get too creative between her and Malcolm, but brilliance and intelligence were again, words that fit, words that make sense, words that typify and describe these fantastic individuals. Next up, you've heard his name mentioned a couple times. You heard his name mentioned when we talked about Malcolm. You heard his name mentioned when I talked about Madam C.J. Walker. I'm talking about none other than the right, excellent, honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey deserves a statue in this country now. Some people would say, hey, 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 wait. Marcus Garvey's from Jamaica. Why would someone from another country deserve a statue in the United States? I would pause and say, let's just recollect for a moment. Have you heard the name Christopher Columbus before? Do you know about Christopher Colon, AKA Christopher Columbus, AKA the dude that was born in Italy, worked on behalf of Spain and never stepped foot in these United States? He has statues in the United States. He has cities, Columbus, Ohio, Columbus, Georgia, named after him. There is a national holiday in honor of this dude who never stepped foot, you heard me right, never stepped foot one time on these United States. Yet and still, he's honored, he's praised, he's given statues. So don't tell me that this brother from Jamaica does not, should not, could not have a statue in these United States. Let's learn a little bit about Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey created the largest black organization in modern history. At its height, the Universal Negro Improvement Association founded by Marcus Garvey had over 1 million paid members. I didn't stutter, I didn't stammer, I was clear. 1 million paid members. I'm not talking about 1 million followers, 1 million likes on the post. I'm talking about 1 million paid members. Over 7 million members that were a part of the organization, that believed in the tenets, that believed in the foundation of his message and messaging of the organization. The message was real simple. Something that we should attach to today. He said, essentially, if you're Black, then you're African. I don't care if you're from Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, you're an African. I don't care if you're from Haiti, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, you are an African. I don't care if you're from Ghana, South Africa, Egypt, Algeria, you are an African. And it's not only your right, but your responsibility to use your time, talent, and resources to come together. What he really said, the motto of the organization was one God, one aim, one destiny. One God, one aim, one destiny. In essence, he said, I don't care what your politics are, if you're a Democrat or Republican, you an African first. I don't care if you're from the West side or the East side, you an African. I don't care if you are Episcopalian, Methodist, Baptist, I don't believe in nothing. The creator of all things created you as an African person. Everything else that you have, every other label that's attached to you is something that you chose second. That was your opinion. That was your choice to become a Republican or Democrat, live on the east side or the west side, become an Episcopalian, a Protestant, a Methodist, a Baptist. You chose those things. But the creator of all things chose you first to be an African. And on that premise, on that foundation, we must come together. This was the message of the Universal Negro Improvement Association. This is why it was simple and connected with the hearts and the spirits of so many people. Marcus Garvey. He had an international newspaper that was shipped internationally on the Universal Negro Improvement Association's own ships. That's right. Marcus Garvey, Universal Negro Improvement Association, had ships that carried produce from South America to the East Coast. 
They had ships that carried the Negro world all around this world. There were parts of Africa where it was the duty of young children to go and stand by the dock and wait for the Universal Negro Improvement Association ships to arrive with these newspapers. It was the duty of these children because the elders felt as if learning English would further detach them through colonization and what have you, further detach them from their history, their roots, their culture. So there were some people who held the line and said, I'm not going to learn an invader's language. And so the children, they wanted them to be more broad and have more perspective and have more abilities than them. So they allowed the children to learn English, but there were some who held the line and said, I'm not going to learn English. So it was the job of some children, stand on the dock of the bay, wait for this Negro world to arrive, the newest copy, read the Negro world, commit it to memory, then run back to town, stand on the street corner and recite word for word the words and wisdom of Marcus Garvey and tell them what these black folks are doing across the water in the United States. Tell them about the black cross nurses. Yes, did you know we have black cross nurses? Marcus Garvey said, anything that anyone else has, we should have for ourselves with people who specialize in us. Marcus Garvey knew then what we are just now beginning to discover, that our melanin is more than just our skin color. But we have major parts in our brain that have melanin. We have muscle groups that have melanin. We have melanin in our eyes. We have melanin in the inner parts of our ears that make us interact with the world differently. Marcus Garvey knew this. And so he had trained Black Cross nurses. Look it up. You don't have to believe not one word I ever say in any video. Everything's verifiable, documentable, things that you could and should research and tell a friend to tell a friend. Tell a child so they can become inspired. They were constantly having parades. He said that there should be parades where you begin to change or rearrange the thoughts in your mind, where you see black excellence. The Honorable Marcus Garvey, up and down the streets of New York, would have these major parades where you see hundreds of men and women with ostrich feathers on their head, dressed to the nines in military outfits, doing all sort of military movements. Then you would have the nurses. Then you would have uh, posters and billboards of the ships that we had purchased. He offered stock. Yes, there are stock certificates for the Universal Negro Improvement Association. The brother was far, far, far before his time. Do you know that he was arrested on trumped up charges, placed in jail, and a condition of his release would be that he would be deported. How many folks are arrested and the condition of their release is to be deported? Again, showing you that he was a messianic figure. He was a messenger with a message that was right on time then and now. He was an early champion of the Back to Africa movement. He said if the rights of a black man and a black woman and black child are not respected in this country, then you know what? We can leave this country. We can go back to our ancestral homeland. They raised money in the UNIA to purchase land in Africa. They said, we got the means, we have the ability, we have the ship through self-determination, we're gonna go back to Africa. But do you know that this government in the United States hired agents in order to thwart, to get off track, to steal the money of the Universal Negro Improvement Association? Look it up. The very first FBI agent in this country was hired to step in and disrupt the Universal Negro Improvement Association. We're gonna have a free giveaway. We're gonna give a pack of the red and the pack of the black, black history cards. The first person who writes down in the chat or sends in an email to us uh, the name, the agency name of the first black FBI agents. Check it out, the FBI was racist and was like, oh man, we racist. We don't have any black people that, that work here. However, we want to invade. We want to be undercover for black organizations. So, like, oh man, we got to hire somebody black. And so the very first black FBI agent was hired to infiltrate the UNIA. What was his government name? Not, not, not his government name, his uh, government uh, um, office name. Drop that in the chat or, drop, or send us an email. And again, you're gonna get a free gift to anyone who uh, responds to that. The Universal New Year Improvement Association was responsible for the creation of the red, black, and green flag. The red 
I'm paraphrasing, but the red, he said, is for the blood of our ancestors, those who lived, struggled, and died to allow us to be who we are and what we are today. The black is symbolic of the people who's not only it's their right, but their responsibility to ensure that the legacy of those who came before us were not in vain. It's our right and our responsibility to carry the torch, further the baton in this race called life for our people. That's what the black represents, symbolic of the black people here and now. The green, he said, is to remind us of our motherland of Africa and its riches, and to remind us of the rewards of our struggles. Red, black, and green. Red is for the blood of our ancestors. The black is for us living here and now. The green reminds us of Africa and reminds us of the, of the rewards of our people. Marcus Messiah Garvey, Garvey, the right, excellent, honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, deserves a statue in these United States for amplifying and electrifying the black masses, having the largest black organization that this country has ever seen. One million paid members in a time with no social media, no telephone. That is what I'm talking about, organization. Some words that will be on the pillars, each side of the platform that holds up this 100-foot statue of Marcus Garvey, in my mind, would be visionary, practical, leader, and before his time. The brother was before his time. I mean, some of the stuff, not even everything he was coming with in the early 1900s, some of the stuff is just now being discussed, just now trying to be theorized and formalized of how we're going to make this, some of this stuff happen. Again, Black-owned resources, Black-owned uh, shipping, Black-owned transport, Black-owned, uh, uh, again, A, A to Z, end to end uh, transportation of goods. The brother was on this in the early 1900s. Mark, I'm sorry, Garvey. Some people have asked since the last video, how can I support? How can we be involved? How can we get more of this knowledge, history, and information? The easiest way, go to black365.com, purchase one of the products. We have a Black 365 calendar, a calendar that highlights an event in Black history every single day. We have two, back, two packs of Black history cards. One pack uh, has 52 cards and 52 quotations from some of the greatest minds in our history. The other pack has facts about individuals. We have a book from A to Z. You can learn about someone of African descent from A to Z that has done something tremendous and has shaped this globe. Or you can uh, make a donation at um, Cash App at Black365 Calendar. If you prefer PayPal, you can go to paypal.me slash Black365 Calendar. Let us take a quick pause for the cause. And stop the Zoom for one quick second. Be right back. A quotation. All right, we're back. A quotation I wanted to share from the Honorable Marcus Garvey. He says that a people without knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. <clears throat> One more time. A people without knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. Let's get back into the presentation. Here we go. Let's play here. Again, ways that you can support the channel, ways that you can support the program, the movement, portion of every item sold at blackfish65.com goes towards scholarships. Again, those are ways that you can continue to support what we have going on next. Next up, this individual beyond a shadow of a doubt is necessary. This person beyond a shadow of a doubt is outperformed the requirements for a statue to be erected, resurrected, created in her name, in her honor. I'm talking about the Honorable Shirley Chisholm. For those who may not know, Shirley Chisholm was the first African-American to receive a major party nomination. I wrote vote there, but nomination for president of the United States of America. That's right. No black man, no black woman prior to Shirley Chisholm received the major party nomination for president of the United States. In the early 1970s, she was a congresswoman from the great state of New York. Excuse me representative from the great state of New York, and she put in her bid to become president of the United States of this country. Do you know that she endured not one, not two, not three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, but 11 documented assassination attempts? That's right, 11 attempts on her life. All she wanted to do was express her right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, her right to life, liber liberty, and freedom, her rights so-called right, to run, to lead this country. There would be no Barack Obama as we know it. 
if it was not for Shirley Chisholm. There would be no vice president, female, black candidate of this country or for this country if there was no Shirley Chisholm, an honorable woman who did amazing things. More should be said, more should be done about her. All these amazing images that you see are from the Black 365 products, by the way. Just wanna make sure I put that in there. Her motto, there's a book, there's a movie, based on her motto that she was unbought and unbossed. That's right, unbought and unbossed was her motto, meaning nobody, no amount of money, no amount of persuasion, no amount of potential fame and fortune would allow herself to deny herself, would allow herself to sell out her people. She constantly and consistently had the message that she was unbought and unbossed. Honorable woman, upright woman, valiant woman. These words come to mind when we think of her. These four words should be on the four sides of the platform that holds up the 100 foot tall monument that honors Shirley Chisholm in the United States. Steadfast, meaning holding the line, holding the course. Courageous, again, in the face of adversity, standing strong, in the face of funds being thrown at you, in the face of persuasion, in the face of trinkets being dangled in front of you, sell out your people, stop what you're doing, and we'll pay you. Turn your back on your people. Be less than honorable. She said, nah, it's not happening. Shirley Chisholm, true trailblazer. And again, like Marcus Garvey, she was before her time. Look her up, do your own research, find out more, dig a little deeper into the character into the characteristics, into the accomplishments of Miss Shirley Chisholm. We're almost wrapping up here. We had three ladies, and we had three men, and we have one more statue after this one. The honorable, exquisite, unmatched Robert Smalls de de deserves a statue in these United States. I I've been wrestling with myself if I wanted to use this term in order to describe Mr. Robert Smalls is a term that we use colloquially in the language of the streets. We would say that Robert Smalls, well, his actions at least, were gangster. I know that's not a politically correct term. I know it's not a good term to be a, a gangster in the true definition of the word, uh, true definition of the words. Nevertheless, in the language of today, his actions were gangster. Let's dive into who this brother was. This brother escaped from enslavement, much like Harriet Tubman, but the fashion in which he did it truly is something that I think a major Hollywood motion picture, that, strike that, a major movie, don't have to be come from, doesn't have to come from Hollywood, an independent film. Someone, some people with the vision and the equipment and the acting skills to pull it off should make a movie about Robert Smalls. Let me tell you about his daring escape from enslavement. Robert Smalls was reared in South Carolina. He was a figure that just emanated leadership, emanated bravery, emanated manhood. And so despite the fact that he was enslaved, the enslavers oftentimes refused to put chains on Robert Smalls, just because he was that much of a man. And he just had bravery and just had might associated with him. So he was beloved and, and, and trusted for his intellect, his wit, his articulation, his stature. He was on a ship called the Planter. This wasn't any old ship. This was a prized Confederate warship. Unlike all the other enslaved Africans on the ship, Robert Smalls, they would not put chains on him, even at night. He heard about a soiree, a party, a fest, a fest, the festival that was gonna take place among some Confederate soldiers, I believe it was May 2nd. Uh, the year is escaping me at this exact moment. But uh, what he did was, devised a plan, a daring escape. He put word out to some family and friends, meet me by the river on this night. And on that night, as the overseers got off the ship to go to their soiree, their party, Robert Smalls donned the captain's hat, put the captain's cob pipe in his mouth because it was a situation where people on the shore could see, because of the dim light and the lights on the ship, the silhouette of a man. 
So he looked as if he was the captain and began sailing the ship through some river channels with the ultimate goal of picking up Africans along the river and sailing out to the, o to the Atlantic Ocean and delivering the ship to an awaiting Union blockade. But let me just add on one piece of heroism. Along these channels that reached out to the ocean, there were Confederate checkpoints. Each checkpoint, one had to give out the call or whistle and do the hand signs of the Confederate captains. Robert Small stood on the bow of the boat at each place, gave the sign, gave the, gave the sign of the captain and got through each blockade, got the ship out to open water after picking up several Africans, after going down below, untying all the other Africans, unchaining all the other Africans and delivered this prized Confederate warship to the Union forces. I don't know about you, but that is amazing. That takes skill, that takes wit, that takes heart, that takes soul, that takes determination. Robert Smalls. After doing so, he secured the immediate freedom for himself and all others on board, his family, his children. I would have just kicked up my feet and been chilling after that. Like, man, I just made a hella move. I just pulled off something that no one else ever thought of. He got some prize money. He was awarded some, uh, some funds and was set. But the brother wanted to use politics in order to further change and rearrange the minds of people and set forth and enact laws. He went on to become a member of the South Carolina Senate and Congress. He was a representative on both sides, not of the aisle, but on both sides of the uh, houses of government, uh, the Senate and Congress in the state of South Carolina. This here was perhaps even the most gangster act of all of them. He went on to purchase the house that he was formerly enslaved in. So the house where he was once a field hand, the house in which he was once beaten at, the house in which he was once had the most horrible, hellish acts of enslavement acted upon him and others. The brother in a twisted fate of irony purchased the house that he was formerly enslaved in and lived there for the rest of his days. And there's still a statue in the courtyard for him that stands to this day. It's a small statue, but for those larger than life acts, this brother deserves a larger than life statue. And so a statue of Robert Small should stand in this country today, 100 feet tall, standing with Papa Pillar. The bottom of that platform on all four sides should read these words, in my humble opinion, heroic, clever, diligent, and most of all, ambitious. The brother had the ambition, the audacity of hope, the audacity of freedom, and pulled it off. It had the audacity to buy the house that he was formerly enslaved in. Man, that's one of the most, one of the most flyest moves I've ever seen in my life. Again, at this time, drop a like, drop a comment, subscribe, tell a friend to tell a friend about these videos. If you've learned anything, if you've had your heartstrings plucked, if you have been touched by any of these words, tell a friend, tell a friend, like this video, share it, tell people to come to black365.com for more information. And also let us know, send us an email at info at black365.us, I-N-F-O at black365.us, or comment if you're watching this on YouTube or uh, Facebook, social media, uh, comment below on who you think deserves a statue in the comments. I've heard, some say Paul Robeson, I've heard some say Booker T. Washington. Again, there are plenty, but there might have to actually be a part two to this, uh, to this video, because again, there's so many, it was so difficult to come up with this list. But last, but certainly not least, a statue that needs to be raised in these United States today is a statue to the unnamed African, the unnamed black man. And after I put this presentation together, I uh, wanted to uh, double back and put together a man, woman, and child. But for right now, this is an image that we've had created uh, and it's inside of one of our uh, Black 365 products. Uh, but truly, a statue erected for the unnamed Black man, woman, and child. We know that Black men, women, and children risked life and limb in innumerable 
heroic acts. From the time we were on the continent of Africa, being taken from the interior of Africa, forced migrated to the shores of Africa. There were brothers and sisters whose names did not make the history books, who did great and mightiful things for our people. And it goes without precedent. There is a statue to the unnamed soldier. I believe it's in Washington, D.C. So again, it does not go without precedence that this country has given honor and paid homage and created statues for unnamed people. And so for the unnamed freedom fighters that fought for the cause of the liberation of black people, they deserve a statue in this country. Those who fought in those dungeons on the west coast of Africa, risked life, risked limbs, freed themselves, committed the ultimate sacrifice of giving up their body for freedom, they deserve a statue. Those who during the transatlantic slave trade, that three month sojourn from the west coast of Africa to the south of America, to South America, the South of the United States, to the islands, there were folks that were throwing people over the sides of ships. It wasn't uncommon for a woman to throw her baby over the side of the ship, shouting, crying, saying the words, I don't know what's on the other side, but my child will not be anyone's slave. I can't even think of the might. I can't even think of the strength. I can't even conjure up or articulate into words what it would take. I'm a parent. What it would take for a parent to do and to commit and to give the ultimate sacrifice to ensure that their child would not have to live a life enchained in bondage and enslaved. So for those people, we must honor them. On the plantations in this country, in the American South and elsewhere, in those islands, in the island of Haiti, Togo, Jamaica, in places like Brazil, there were individuals who purposely worked slow. There were individuals who purposely broke their tools. There were individuals who poisoned the overseer. There were individuals who ran away. There were individuals who by the light of candle, by the light of the moon, risked it all to learn how to read. Risked it all. Sometimes had their tongues cut out. Sometimes had their foot cut off. In the pursuit of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. In the pursuit of education. That's why it pains me so much. I work at a college right now. It's my nine to five. It pains me so much when I hear individuals talk about that acting smart is acting white. Learning how to read, learning how to do the math. That's for somebody else. Math is for, for Asians and math and all these other things, all these other subjects. No, other people. No, don't you know that we are the mothers and fathers of civilization? The world's first doctors, first lawyers, first politicians, first mathematicians. We were the first to create institutions of higher learning where people came from all over the globe to study our information. And when they returned to their homes, they claimed our information as their own. I make that point, I make that statement to say that we have forever, since the beginning of time, been true seekers of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, true seekers of higher information. We have the Dogon who learned about the stars. We had people who were agrarian or agricultural masters. We created many of the inventions that this world has seen and enjoys but have not been given credit for. Unnamed brothers and sisters who had patents stolen from them. Unnamed brothers and sisters who built Black Wall Street. We know some of the names, but we don't know them all. Unnamed brothers and sisters who built Rosewood, Wilmington, um, North Carolina, built homesteads in at what we know as Allensworth, California. We don't know all the names. And so for all of the unnamed individuals of African descent who lived, struggled, and died to allow us to be who we are and what we are today, it's not only our right, in my opinion, but it's our responsibility that we push forward to see. Or let's just say, if I was bestowed the cap of being the purveyor and creator of national monuments, these are the seven statues that I would create to be enjoyed, to be studied, to be admired, to be protected for our people. Next up, I'm gonna show you a brief, brief three minute video that comes to us from Baton Rouge, from an activist who articulated in his opinion why 
one of the schools named after Robert E. Lee, a Confederate uh, general, should be renamed. Again, you just hear some of the passion, some of the perspectives as to why this naming, why these statues, why these monuments, why these, uh, again, names and titles of buildings is so important. Take a listen, let me know what you think. Next. So I had intended to come here and talk about how great Robert E. Lee was, but I'm gonna talk about you, Connie. Sitting over there, why are we talking about Robert E. Lee? That's the first thing that's happened. Why are we talking about racism and history in this country? Only white members of this board got up while we were up here talking, too. Because you don't give a damn. And it's clear. Not only did when he whooped the slaves, he said, lay it on them hard. After he said, lay it on them hard, he said, put wine on them, sort of burn them. That's what Robert E. Lee did. And you sit your arrogant self in here and sit on that shopping while the pain and the hurt of the people of this community is on display. You don't give a damn. You resign. You resign two years ago when you killed the white man in his house. You should have resigned two weeks ago when you got on TV and said foolishness. And you should walk out of here and resign and never come back. You are an example of racism in this community. Is that a school board meeting? You are board. horrible. Not to the rest of the board. You have an obligation to the people of this community. And 81% of them are black. And do you need a Klan rally outside, Mr. Goday, before you end it? Because holding it up. It's all over the country they burn this stuff down. And black folks in this city with protests. I ain't seen you elected officials out there with them, making sure that they go south and reproach. It's been folks in this community who give a damn, not just when it's comfortable, but every time. And four years ago we came down here. Mr. Drake, they say you're a good man. Be a good man. Black folks say you're a good man. White folks say you're a good man. Your legacy is a dead man tonight, brother. Mm, legacy. Your legacy. Now, Solidarity I've seen out of y'all in forever. Let's keep stand on this moving forward. Because we don't need to apologize to her. She told you who she was when she was sitting next to you while you were talking shopping. You don't need to be an example. No, you need to win Baton Rouge. Stop being an idiot and then you want to launch into the next chapter so you win it. Put on PBS Newsmax. He was the first black governor of the state of Louisiana. Right. When he was governor during Another name, Oscar Dunn, who was the lieutenant governor of the state of Louisiana in the 1860s, that gave me the right for Darius Brandon and Lauren Holland and, and Evelyn Ware Jackson and Tramiel Howard to give you. You want to name it after somebody from Reconstruction? Name it after the people who fought for Appalachian of Surrey. If you want to name it after somebody, honor the right people, the people who are on the right side of history. But it's your ancestor that the school is named after. So you're holding on to your heritage. But we feel this joint for free. And we've done better than you right. Thank you, sir. Gary Chambers. Gary Chambers Jr. with some cogent words, some cogent perspective, some articulate words as to why the naming of buildings is so important. We are at an interesting time at this point in history. There's where you can check me out. Again, if you've appreciated this video, check out black365.com. Follow us on Instagram, black365calendar, or you can follow me at Professor Jamal on social media, um, all platforms. Again, it has been a pleasure connecting with you wherever you're at in the world, whether I'm being broadcast on your cell phone or on your Apple TV or whatever the case. Again, I appreciate you. Follow us. We're going to be making more and more of these videos to give us some topics that you would like to see. And again, give us the seven people that you think deserve statues in this country. Black statues should be erected in place of those that have been taken down. Again, I am your brother, Jamal Brown, Professor Jamal, aka Ms. Black 65, and I'll talk to you later. Peace.